Hello and welcome to the Annapolis Royal Historic Gardens in beautiful Annapolis Royal, Nova Scotia. My name is Karen Achenbach and I'm the horticultural manager here at the gardens. The gardens was opened in August of 1981, so we're fast approaching our 40th anniversary and I have been lucky enough to have been gardening here for the past 40 plus years. First as the supervisor of maintenance and then as horticultural manager with the retirement of our first horticulturist, Pat Pelham. I very much enjoyed taking part in the construction and maintenance of the gardens over the years and watching all the plants grow and mature. As we near our 40th anniversary, we all take pleasure in how the gardens has developed into what we have now. So why the historic gardens? We'll start with a little background on where we are. The town is located in the southwestern part of Nova Scotia across the North Mountain from the Bay of Funday, which has the world's highest tides. We're at the convergence of two rivers, the Annapolis River and the Allens River. We're in Zone 6B, one of the mildest parts of the province. In past times, the Europeans referred to this land, which includes the Maritime Provinces, the Gaspé Peninsula and parts of Maine, as the colony of Acadia, or Acadie by the French. The town of Annapolis Royal, where the gardens is located, was formerly called Port Royal by the first European settlers and was the capital of Acadia for many years. Control of this area went back and forth between the French and the British seven times before the British took final control in the early 1700s. Port Royal's name was changed to Annapolis Royal in 1710 in honor of Queen Anne when the British took power. The Annapolis Royal Historic Gardens is situated on 17 acres steeped in history overlooking a tidal river valley. We have 10 acres of cultivated gardens and 7 acres of dike lands. And the gardens have been designed to illustrate the rich history of the area over four centuries. The historically themed areas are interspersed with plant collections such as the Rose Garden, Daylily Collection, Perennial Border and Rock Garden. So, we'll meet in the courtyard for our tour. This has been designed as a welcoming space with features to be attractive through the seasons. Magnolias for early spring, our laburnum arbor with its golden chains for early June, along with rhododendrons, nova zembla, and borsoe. Later on, Japanese tree lilacs and viburnums are showy and fragrant. And now we'll head to the pine forest. The pine forest represents the pre-European settlement period. Where the gardens is situated at the confluence of the Annapolis and Allens River has historically been a gathering place for the indigenous people, the Mi'kmaq, who have lived here for thousands of years. Archaeological evidence suggests this area was the location of a summer encampment and the Allens River was the beginning of a travelway across the province. The forest classification is known as the Acadian Forest, which includes white and red pine, white and red spruce, yellow birch, red oak, sugar maple, American beech, and eastern hemlock. Many of the plants found in these forests were important to the Mi'kmaq. In 1605, French explorers under the command of Pierre Dugas sur Demont and his cartographer Samuel de Champlain established the settlement of Port Royal on the north side of the Annapolis River. This became the first permanent European settlement in North America north of St. Augustine in Florida. The French settlers became known as Acadians and had a thriving culture for several generations. They built the first dikes in North America in order to keep out the high tides and reclaim salt marsh areas to grow crops and pasture their livestock. With their friends and allies, the Mi'kmaq, they felt secure even when sovereignty over this area went back and forth between the French and the British, finally landing in British hands with the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713. However, because the Acadians refused to swear allegiance to the British, they were deported from Acadia in 1755. Known as Le Grand Derangement, the Acadians were gathered up, put on ships, and their houses burned. They were sent to disparate places, including British colonies, France, and the Caribbean, often separating families and loved ones. Many ended up in Louisiana, where they became known as Cajuns. 
You may be familiar with Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, Evangeline, which tells the story of an Acadian girl named Evangeline and her search for her lost love, Gabrielle, set during the time of the expulsion of the Acadians. Our Acadian house is a replica of a pre-deportation Acadian dwelling of around the year 1671. There was a census taken in that year, and we have featured the names of the families on a plaque by the dwelling. The house is post and beam construction with clay walls and an outdoor clay oven. We have a thatched roof with the thatching material coming from a stand of Phragmites australis, also called Norfolk reed, that grows on the site. On the slope below the garden, we have an Acadian orchard, which has varieties of apples that would have been grown in this time period. The house overlooks the dike lands, which were reconstructed in the 1980s on the lines of the original Acadian dikes. Now to the 18th century. From 1710 to the founding of Halifax in 1749, Annapolis Royal was the capital of Nova Scotia and home to the governor of the colony. The design for this small formal garden is based on a map and description of the original governor's garden in 1748. It is constructed in a formal colonial style with straight paths and raised geometric beds planted with herbs, flowers, and fruit trees that would have been grown in the 18th century. The entire garden is surrounded by a yew hedge and hedges of boxwood surround the 18th century apple trees. During the 19th century, Annapolis Royal was the center for fishing, shipbuilding, and trade. This garden reflects the style of gardening during the Victorian period, when many new and exotic plants from all corners of the globe were discovered and introduced to cultivation by explorers. Many of these plants were tender annuals that needed to be started in greenhouses and were therefore fairly expensive to grow. This is a very labor-intensive style of gardening, but the manpower was available at that time. In this garden, there are many of the bedding plants that would have been found in gardens during this period. These include geraniums, salvia, zinnias, coleus, canna, lobelia, and snapdragons, and plants with whimsical names such as cherry pie plant, love lies bleeding, and four o'clocks. Flowering shrubs, including forsythia, flowering quince, bridal wreath, and snowball bush were also popular. The innovative garden is our modern garden to represent the 21st century. It is a productive, edible landscape, backyard type of garden, which demonstrates plants and techniques that our visitors can use in their own gardens. We demonstrate organic gardening techniques and grow modern scab-resistant apple trees developed at our local research center. We show how to garden in a small space using raised beds and espaliered fruit trees and grapevines trained against fences and hardy kiwi vines on trellises. We have themed areas where we feature heirloom vegetables, a greens bed, mulch trials, and unusual fruits and vegetables such as a pawpaw tree, globe artichokes, and peanuts. So those are our four centuries of gardens. Our various collections are interspersed amongst these gardens. The Rose Garden displays specimens of rose cultivars that were popular from the time of the first settlers here to the present day. We have over 275 cultivars of roses. The collection includes heirloom roses such as gallicas, damasks, albas, and centifolias. We have beds of hybrid perpetuals, hybrid teas, floribundas, grandifloras, musks, and English roses. We feature Canadian roses, such as the Explorer series from Ottawa and the Parkland series from Morden, Manitoba. We also have our own maritime roses, a group of small flowered roses developed by a local breeder. A maze and hedge of shrub roses encloses the far end of the garden. Labels beside individual plants indicate their type, cultivar, and date of introduction. Now we'll move on into our ornamental grass collection. Grasses such as ribbon grass and variegated miscanthus have been used in gardens for centuries, but in recent decades there's been an increasing interest in grasses in the landscape. Every season brings new cultivars available to use. 
We have over 35 cultivars of grasses and bamboo in our collection, many of them developed for unusual color and form. The garden is at its best in the late summer and fall when the color, the texture, the movement and sound make this a feast for the senses. Most of the plants in the spring color collection have been selected for their spring flowers. This part of the gardens is at its peak in May and June, and included in this collection are several cultivars of lilac, spirea, kusa dogwoods, and many different magnolia cultivars. Surrounding a series of three descending ponds is our daylily and hydrangea collection. We have over 100 cultivars of daylily and over 25 different cultivars of hydrangea. On the hillside along our bottom path, we have our heather collection. We have over 40 cultivars of Kaluna displayed with hydrangeas and dwarf conifers. It's at its height when in bloom in late summer, but it makes a beautiful carpet for most of the season. Our perennial bed is designed in the English border style and contains over 150 cultivars of herbaceous perennials. The collection is designed to give a continuous succession of color, texture, and form throughout this growing season. The rock garden is built with large granite boulders and contains a variety of alpine plants and dwarf plant material. Included in this garden are plants such as gentians, dwarf hinoki, cypress, Japanese maples, perennial geraniums, daphne, and creeping thyme. The native plant garden is our newest collection and it is a collection of Nova Scotia native plants used to create a welcoming habitat for birds and pollinators, including bees and butterflies. Many of these plants in the garden provide food, such as fruits, seeds, and nectar, while others serve as shelter for these creatures. Here you will find trees, shrubs, and perennial plants, such as wild pear, American mountain ash, bayberry, native grasses and sedges, asters, and several kinds of berries. We have an annual display of sculpture in the gardens, representing various artists from across the province. The combination of garden and sculpture has been met with great enthusiasm from our visitors. And now to our rhododendron collection. We approach the rhododendron collection via a path that takes us to the look-off overseeing the tidal river and marshlands. Along this path, we see Minas Maid, Gold Fort, Windbeam, and the Red of Stuart Stonian. Our plants grow in full sun, as well as in the understory and along the edges of a mature English oak grove. In our climate, 6B, most of our rhododendrons seem to prefer full sun. We have naturally acidic soil. Rhododendrons do well here, as do other ericaceous plants, such as Enchianthus, Calmia, Leucothoe, and Pyrus. These plants are also found in this part of the gardens. The major rhododendron collection is situated in two large beds on a southeast facing slope. Here we see many of our deciduous and evergreen azaleas and beyond is a specimen of Evangeline. On the right are specimens of Francesca, a small mist maiden and Caucianum cultivars Alba and Best Pink. In another bed we see specimens of Ginny G, George Monroe's favorite, Ramapo, and Cairns. The slope merges into a lovely little vale where more rhododendrons and azaleas are displayed on the edge of a pond. The tidal river beyond provides a complementary backdrop. Here we have Weston's Aglow, Francesca, Mist Maiden, and rhododendron Oreotrephes.
In our collection, we have over 150 species and cultivars of rhododendron. Much of the plant material in the beginning years was donated to us from the Kentville Research Station. The Atlantic Rhododendron and Horticultural Society have very generously donated over the years many of the other rhododendrons we have here in the gardens. Many of the plants featured in our collection have a Nova Scotian history. We have a number that are products of the breeding program at the Kentville Research Station, as well as some bred by Nova Scotians such as Commander Richard Steele, John Weagle, and Alex Muntz. In 1958, a program designed to breed improved rhododendrons and azaleas for Atlantic Canada began at the Agricultural Research Station in Kentville, Nova Scotia. Under the direction of Dr. Donald Craig and George Swain, crosses were made until 1975. We feature a number of the Kentville hybrids here. In the naming of several of these, these cultivars, we can see the connection to Longfellow's Acadian poem, Evangeline. Bellefontaine is Evangeline's family name. And both Evangeline and Bellefontaine are crosses of Fortunii and Smyrnoii, and the specimen of Bellefontaine at the Kentville Research Station has reached 14 feet in 40 years. Grand Pre is a Catawbiense Williamsianum cross. It has a profusion of pink bell-shaped flowers in loose trusses and small dark green oval leaves. In full sun, it forms a perfect dense mounded dome and grows three feet tall in 10 years. One of my favorites. Other Kentville hybrids we have are Minus Snow, a beautiful white, and Minus Made, a cross with Nova Zembla and Yakushimanum. We also have the Kentville Azalea, minus gold, among others. A few of the rhododendrons we have of Captain Steele's are Barber Hall, which has rich pink blooms that have a deeper pink throat and soft green foliage. It was named in honor of a founding member of the Atlantic region of the Canadian Rhododendron Society, which was the first iteration of the Atlantic Rhododendron and Horticultural Society. And we have Nancy Steele, which we knew for a long time as Bayport 80-5. Named in honor of his wife, this is one of our earliest bloomers and we eagerly look forward to its cheery yellow blooms in the spring. Boulderwood Blue is a striking powder blue with foliage similar to Ramapo. It blooms in mid-May and is very floriferous. Alex Muntz gardened in Clemensport, Nova Scotia, not far from our gardens, and engaged in a breeding program using rhododendron fortunii crossed with jock. From this cross came the very beautiful Anna Muntz, named for his wife. Another lovely Muntz hybrid was called Marilyn Brown, named for a friend from just down the road from us. We're also very pleased to have several of the evergreen azaleas from John Weagle's Scotian series. Among them are Scotian Breeze, which is a compact, late-blooming plant with bicolored flowers and cool pink tips. Sc Scotian Clouds with white flowers edged bright reddish pink. Scotian Mist, a soft pastel pink fading to white in the centers and Scotian Fire, a late June blooming hybrid with large orange-red flowers. Although not exactly a Nova Scotia connection, Joseph Bruckner was living in New Brunswick when he began breeding rhododendrons before moving to Ontario, so we have a maritime connection. Two that were developed in New Brunswick are Blue Nose and Azure. They're siblings, both with clear blue flowers and an open upright habit. Other Bruckner hybrids we have are Nahani, Montefon, and Lionel's Red Shield. We also have Isola Bella with peach buds opening pastel pink and fading to white, very early and very floriferous with a beautiful distinct dark green foliage. One of our favorite sections is an area we refer to as the Baron's Azaleas. In 1984, in the early years of the garden's existence, 
Baron Edmund de Rothschild of Exbury Gardens visited Annapolis Royal. He had traveled to see the new tidal power generating station, which was just opening, as he had a great interest in renewable energy. While he was here, he was given a tour of the historic gardens. So impressed was he that upon returning home to England, he had a dozen azaleas sent to Annapolis Royal from his own Exbury Gardens to add to the historic gardens collection. Among the cultivars we received are Daybreak, Rennie, Homebush, and Cecile. Apart from the plants from the Baron, we also have other deciduous azaleas, such as the Knapp Hill azaleas. Among them are Shanty and Knapp Hill Red. Other Exbury azaleas, such as Gallipoli Red, Golden Dream, and Gibraltar, help make up our collection. We also feature quite a few species of rhododendron. Here we show rhododendron abiculari, rhododendron oreotrephes, and rhododendron impeditum. We also have rosatum and berevii with its beautiful foliage and lovely indumentum. We also have rhododendron augustinii subspecies tasmanthum which is a floriferous and vigorous, dense, upright, growing species with pointed dark green foliage, a beautiful addition to the garden. We also have rhododendron vasii in both the pink and the white form. Here we have rhododendron William C. Annum and rhododendron minus variety minus, formerly Carolinianum. Other rhododendrons we have are gable hybrids, such as Big Joe, with, which is an early blooming old gable hybrid with large pale lavender pink flowers with a dark blotch. We have Mildred May and Stuart Stonian, which is an early blooming floriferous bright red hybrid. County of York is a hardy, vigorous growing plant with large upright white trusses. Berg hybrids. We have Ginny G, which is a vigorous and tough lepidote with bright pink buds opening to blush pink and then fading to white. It has dense dark green foliage and it's very floriferous. Patty B, which we have in our rock garden, is a dwarf, very floriferous yellow hybrid. It's early blooming and its dense foliage turns maroon red in winter. And golf is a beautiful plant that can be grown for its foliage alone. The foliage is deep green, but in spring and summer, the new foliage is covered with silver indumentum. Some of our leech hybrids are Bravo, which is a late mid-season bloomer with light purplish pink flowers shading lighter in the center with sparse brown spotting. Spellbinder, which is one of my favorites, has large, full, ball-shaped trusses of pink flowers from egg-sized buds. Its large leaves to 10 inches long are really impressive. And Holden's solar flare is a beauty with its cheery yellow flowers. I also have uh, Yukushimana mist maiden, and this is another of my favorite plants. It has long, narrow leaves with tan white indumentum. Its new growth is covered in silver tomentum, and it has rosy pink buds that open to form large apple blossom pink trusses fading to white. Some of our Dexter hybrids are Mrs. W.R. Co., Scintillation with its handsome foliage, and Todd Morden, which is a beautiful early flowering hybrid with ball-shaped tresses. The flowers are large and bi-colored. Of the Mesut hybrids from Weston Nurseries in Massachusetts, we have the early blooming Lepidotes, Weston's Aglow, and sister seedling, Olga Mesut. Also, we have Milestone, which is our very earliest to bloom, and Staccato, with its deep rose pink double flowers. And we have the Alepidote, Henry's Red, which is a very hardy hybrid with dark blood red flowers and dark green foliage. And we also very much enjoy the fragrant late blooming azaleas, Lemon Drop, and Pennsylvania. Some of the other rhododendrons we feature are Jack Louie's Elegant Candy with flowers opening pink fading to white with a large burgundy blotch and are held in full dome-shaped trusses. We have Smerber, 
out of Vineland Nurseries, which is a cross between Smyrnoii and Bereviae, and it has beautiful indumentum and foliage. Michener's Calsap, which is a real showstopper with its large conical trusses of snowy white flowers with a large dramatic burgundy blotch. George Monroe's favorite, which is a beauty formerly known as Yap 7. We have Dora Amateus, a very floriferous white, smothering itself in flowers every spring. And Mary Fleming, which is a nearing hybrid with creamy yellow flowers flushed with salmon pink. We hope you've enjoyed the tour of our gardens and hope you have the opportunity to visit soon.